Hello, hello. We're back in the room. Just waiting for a few people to sit down. Have you all had a nice coffee break, uh, all refreshed back in the screen? Um, we've got a slight programme change for this one because Ben Luxford unfortunately couldn't join us, but we have Stuart Brown from BFI who has very kindly jumped in last minute. Um, so he'll be joining Mia on stage in a moment. Can I remind you to use the Menti um, if you can? That's the code. If you go to menti.com and put that in, you can use that for discussion points as well as questions. Stuart and me are keen that there's like an active discussion in the room and with the people online. So if you don't have a question but you want to say a thought, I'll be reading those out as well. So please do use that so we can make it an active discussion. Um, and I will hand over to Mia and Stuart if you'd like to come to the stage. Thank you. So yes, um, I'm the full guy that came in at the last minute, so be kind. I know you're all kind anyway. Um, I think most people out there know me, but just in case you don't, my name is Stuart Brown. I'm the head of program and acquisitions at the BFI. Um, what that means is that I run the teams who um, run our most of our audience-facing activities, not including our festivals. So. I head up the team that runs the BFI South Bank. Um, we do the programming for BFI Player. We run DVD and Blu-ray and BFI Distribution as well. So um, in real terms, my job is <coughs> to think about audiences, to think about those activities, and to kind of optimize the way that we work um, to make our programs coherent. Uh, we do a lot of work on acquisitions deals that kind of um, they form like the bedrock of our program. So we do kind of commercial deals for films where we buy the rights and then that enables us to um, construct our programs. And the, the, the direction of travel really is, is more synergy, <laughs> more coherence. So um, we're less London focused. The kind of utopia for us I think is that BFI program is not seen as a place that you go to in London, but rather it's an entity that you can dip into online on BFI Player. You can go to cinemas at the South Bank, or you can go to cinemas like this one uh, all over the country and see at least a version of the program. Um, I don't think we'll ever achieve like the full cinema tech everywhere thing, although I did like Mark's prov provocation earlier of his baseline of um, five independent cinemas for cities and three for towns. And it's funny because people chuckled at that, but actually I thought that um, if you think about what's happening to our high streets and the kind of decline of the high street, there's space there and I think there's a genuine opportunity. And I, I don't think it's that much of an outrageous proposition for a, a discussion with government given the um, already well-established benefits around well-being and, and the value of cinema as an art form and something that we all um, enjoy in our cultural lives. So. I'm here, if anyone needs to, uh, if anyone wants to ask me questions about BFI program at any point, please do make, make the most of me. Um, I'm stepping in for Ben and I think my job is to introduce you to Mia, who I think you all know already as well because Mia has been doing amazing work with Bird's Eye View and we're all really excited. She's joining us as the head of BFI Film Fund and I think um, there's a few BFI colleagues in the audience but we're all in the same boat. We're all really looking forward to what Mia's going to bring, what her thoughts are, what her ideas are. Um, it's probably a bit too early to say what your plan is, but um, Mia's got a few slides that she's going to run through and give you an idea of where she's at in the role. So, Thank you, Stuart. Oh, Mia. it's so nice to be here in person. And I know not everyone's in person, so hello at home to or wherever you are beaming in from. Um, it's really lovely to be here. I'm, my paint is still fresh. I'm only six weeks into the job as director of the Film Fund. And, uh, yeah, I think as I, for anyone who maybe read the announcement in screen, um, I celebrate 30 years in film this year, so it's kind of a momentous moment, occasion, to join the British Film Institute, and I don't, don't think I ever really imagined having this role. Uh, I'm not sure entirely what I imagined for myself, but I didn't really think I would be doing this, and so it's kind of a wonderful point at which, it's a wonderful point in time, not just because of that anniversary, and I've done a, a quite a bit of everything. People will know me from Bird's Eye View, but before that I was a film producer, and before that I've been 
I have been in exhibition, I've been in, in, in distribution, and also as an international sales agent. So I'm kind of Jill of all trades, master of all of them, mistress of all of them. Um, not really. <laughs> um, and so it's kind of wonderful actually to sort of bring all of those uh, awarenesses together, but also at this particular point in time, post pandemic, where we all got sent to our rooms to have a good old think about ourselves and the world and obviously lots of us have been through a lot of stuff in terms of business in terms of our personal uh what we've been through personally and perhaps reflecting in maybe ways that we haven't always had time to reflect in in the ways um, and ag across everything that we do um operationally and in terms of how we treat the people that we work with and how we welcome audiences in and all of that so I want to talk a bit about, um, so the point is that I'm here in a kind of listening capacity. As Stuart said, it's, it's too early and I really am wanting to do this job in a way that these kinds of jobs aren't done usually. And so I'm not coming in with a big vision and a big mission um, because I want to kind of take the temperature from across the UK and internationally too. I was in Tallinn last week meet, meeting a lot of my counterparts across Europe and really interesting to hear how they do it and how their systems work in terms of the films they fund and the films that they develop and how they award their funding and how their structures work. Um, so it's wonderful to be here to listen to you and, and I want to hear what you think I should be centering and or not, as the case may be. So I've got a few slides, as Stuart said. Um, so just to um, kind of centre again the kind of values and culture, um, we're in a big consultation process as most people know and have been part of and that is ongoing and so sort of my listening tour is, is where I really want to meet people from across the whole value chain from filmmakers to audience development, cinemas, distribution, international sales, other financiers everyone, people who, who aren't in the industry yet, but who want to be, I'd like to listen to everyone and particularly audiences. So um, these are the kind of values, the BFI's culture and purpose and um, centering storytelling and choice. And that choice is really incredibly important and, the, and a difference and centering difference as well and the quality of difference. And keeping moving image um, culture vibrant is obviously incredibly important helping people to discover and get more out of what we do and the work and then connecting, bringing people together as you've done so wonderfully today. Um, so these are the film fund priorities, the current ones that are taking us through to the to March 2023. So we're kind of in a transition year and so these are the current priorities and these will change. But at the moment, these this is just to tee up what we've got coming through because I'm joining at a point when obviously enormous amount of films got stopped shut down fell apart got back together you know m massively challenged by how they were made and but what's really interesting is i think that the quality of films ha uh, it's in a way been having more time and having to stop in some ways as actually i think often helped the quality of the films, because usually in the independent sector particularly, you're on such a tiny budget, money is time and time is money, and you have no time and you often have really little resources. What this has given people is more time to go away and maybe rest and come back to things, and actually it's really interesting I think to reflect on that and the stories that are coming out now and then also the stories that will come through too we're all every everything every part of what we do is affected by what we've all just been through communally so the current priorities are uh, around talent development and progression and particularly supporting early careers of ambitious filmmakers um, centering impacts and cultural and progressive impacts and then taking risks, particularly the, the kind of stringent rules around lottery funding are that it has to center around market failure. And I'm sure lots of people, and I'm certainly hearing this with producers, everyone's feeling like they're failing in the market at the moment. So that means that everyone, this is a priority for everyone. Um, but 
the you know the the we have to keep coming back to what lottery funding is for and why the the, the difference around the that um, the how we approach what we make is is defined by the fact where of where the money comes from and I, actually it's very helpful I think to to remember that someone probably people in this room bought tickets and some hope went into that purchase they hope for something that transforms perhaps them and their lives and that it and that there's something about that hope i think is quite powerful and important to kind of center when you're thinking about where this money comes from and then where it goes to um and i think there's something about that that needs to kind of, that go that that is important to remember when we make our decisions um, so perspective, recognising the quality of difference in perspective, in talent, in location, in recruitment, and then UK-wide, increasing the number of active projects and filmmakers outside London and the South East. Um, so I just wanted to kind of big up really all the films coming through. So we just had Pirates opening, Reggie Yates' debut, and that's in cinemas now, and... Um, and then Boxing Day is about to come out. I was at the premiere last night, which was absolutely amazing. Curzon Mayfair was packed full of a mill means cast, crew, and also family, because um, it's a, a, a pers inspired by his personal, uh, his own family experience, and with quite a lot of um, artistic difference and license, I must add. But it's such a crowd pleaser, and it was really wonderful to see that a completely packed Curzon Mayfair for the premiere of this film. And so, and then coming up next year, we've got The Souvenir 2, Ali and Ava. I'm sure lots of people have seen these films um, at London Film Festival and or either um, in London or on the tour. Um, Clive Bernard and Joanna Hogg's um, follow-up films. Um, Earwig, uh, Benediction, um, Terence Davis's film, and Lucille. I really struggled with this film, with, with this. Thank you, Hadzil Alevich. Thank you. Um, then we've got, um, we've been doing an immersive pilot. Um, so actually there's a lot of XR and VR work coming through, which Stuart, you're um, very keen on as well, aren't you? Developing VR and XR and what we do about bringing it to audiences beyond those who own headsets and how we do that. And I'm sure other people in this room are engaged around that and very keen to hear about that. So Goliath won um, a prize at Venice and Leica is Asif Kapadier's first um, venture into VR XR and it's beautiful. Uh, and then we had Debbie Tucker Green's Extraordinary and you can catch it on iPlayer and I really, really emphasise the significance of that film and catching it. Please, everyone, find it. It's a really important work, and she's such a significant talent and voice, and she's very special. Uh, and then coming up, um, The Phantom of the Open, which is Craig Roberts' follow-up, which is such a massive crowd-pleaser. And, uh, yeah, I hopefully we'll deliver a big hit for everyone um, in our cinema spaces. And then... Um, these are some of the other ones coming up. The real Charlie Chaplin, which is um, the guys who made um, Notes on Blindness, have done a re-approach to um, Chaplin's biography. Again, stunning piece of work. Uh, and then we've been doing quite a lot. We've been doing an animated animation pilot of, of quite a significant number of animation shorts. Um, and that one, just I wanted to centre that one because it's really beautiful. It's collaboration between... Andrew and Eden Cotton, Eden Cotting, and it's such a beautiful piece of work, diseased and disorderly. Um, and then we've got um, the feast, which we made with Film Comrie, um, which is a Welsh language um, horror, which is also terrific and premiered at London Film Festival. And then True Things, Harry Woodliffe's um, next movie. Uh, and then we've got partnerships with Doc Society. So these are films coming through. So I just really wanted to shout out to you. Some of these films will be on your radars already. Some of them maybe not. I just wanted to talk about, again, I think the films sort of talk, speak to the quality difference. And the I can't take credit for any of them, but it's a lovely time to be joining because the, the slate's really strong, I think, and really diverse. And so these are the films that are funded through the Doc Society. Um, Nascondino, I just saw recently, which is 
um, stunning piece of work um, produced by Jen Corcoran. And, um, and then the Wolf Soup and Rebellion are coming up in the early next year too. Um, and then I would like to, we've got um, screening here. I know there is a, um, we're screening a number of shorts from BFI Network and including Pickney um, by writer, director Michael Jenkins. Is Michael here? So Michael, I would actually like to welcome you up to just say a few words actually at this point. Um, you're one of the founders of Bristol's first black owned TV film production companies, Black Wave. And this was, I think, the first network short to shoot during COVID. So obviously you can speak to the real challenges of making films in this era. Yeah. And uh, it was funded by Network um, and via Film Hub Southwest um, in 2020. So I would just like to hand over to you to just say a little bit about, about the film and your work and whatever else you want to tell the audience. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, um, yeah, so Pickney. Shot in COVID, shot during lockdown, which was which was crazy. Really, uh, yeah. There's lots of challenges, lots of challenges, but you know we work with them. And um, I mean, this is my first film that I've written and directed. And I mean, for a long time, I've been making you know documentaries, music videos, um, really just sort of be living outside of the industry. And um, as soon as I heard that the uh, BFI were coming to, to to Bristol, there would be a, a hub in Bristol. It was. It was amazing because I just thought that for a long time, like a lot of people and a lot of filmmakers that I speak to, they feel like the BFI is sort of out of touch. Mm. Like it's, it's just too far away. It's just an impossible task. But I think having the hubs has really enabled, you know, first time filmmakers like myself to really see the funders as, as an option um, for creativity. So, so yeah, and the film is about a mixed race teenager that, you know, goes on a journey of discovery and understands that his um, identity is a lot more than and skin deep and, and we've had a really good response from, from this film. Um, I just won a, a fan favourite at the uh, American Black Film Festival, which, which for me, I mean, that was my first festival on the other side of the Atlantic and, and it's a big one as well. So that was... That was yeah. yeah, and I, I feel like, I mean, it's just... I think for me and for a lot of filmmakers, we feel like, well, when, once we do, you know, films like this, like shorts, what's the next step? How, how difficult or how hard is it to get, you know, your first feature off the ground, you know, being from, you know, born and raised in Bristol and not really having all those London connects. It's like, it's one of those things that we're, I suppose we're trying to figure out and hopefully over the next few years, you know, the BFI will be able to, you know, I think for me, it's, it's about, enabling the filmmakers across the regions that, that aren't connected to anyone in London, um, but still have those strong stories to tell. Um, British stories, you know? Wonderful, thank you, Michael. And we can, we can see it. It's yeah, so, oh yeah, the yeah. film is yeah. gonna be on today in, at two o'clock in Cinema, Cinema 3. So yeah, it would be great for you to watch it and give me feedback and I'm here to have a chat if you want to show it or anything like that. Do you um, realise yeah. that now everyone's going to be there and no one's going to be in there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take a look at it. It's 15 minutes long. I mean, some of the comments, you know, I had, I had people in tears, which, which as a director, that's what you want. You want to create <laughs> an emotion from people, even if it is, you know, people getting upset. But um, yeah, definitely check it out uh, later on at two o'clock. Beautiful. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. Um, so lots of our regional and national network partners are in the room, so I wanted to say thank you and spotlight all of you. Um, hands up who is um, connected <coughs> to one of the hubs or one of the network partners. Hands up high. Yeah, quite a, I knew a sizable number would be here, so thank you. It's lovely to see you all. Um, there you all are. I won't read out every single person um, but, or, or um, organisation, but you know who you are. Um, so actually, so now, um, well, first of all, I might give Stuart a little moment to, is there anything you want to ask me? Um, and then I'd re really like to ask, um, invite responses. I think, um, as Sally said, actually we want everyone to put them on the system. Got some already. But also comment. So what would you be doing if you were me? Um, what would you like to see us do? Because I'd like to us to be accountable. I want to be accountable um, for what we talk about in rooms like this. 
Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, the, the important things are obviously, you know, how do we recover? There's a lot to recover. And do we need to recover everything from before? Probably not. Uh, and, yeah, what, what next, really? Great. Um, well, uh, the things that Michael was saying actually have, have kind of addressed some of the things. I feel like that was a bit of a manifesto for how you might, <laughs> you might go forwards, actually. Um, obviously, it's extremely important that the BFI work a bit harder to get out and about outside of London and have those kind of connections and dialogues with creatives and people from all areas of the industry. I guess um, the, the thing that I would ask you, given that you've done so brilliantly with Bird's Eye View, and actually with my distribution hat on, some of the titles that we were distributing, you actually transformed their potential audience with that work. Um, I guess the thing that's in my mind is, given that you've just presented what looks like a very strong and diverse slate already, how are you going to bring your kind of commitment to diversity and uh, particularly, all, well, all kinds of diversity, but including gender? I'm, I'm interested in the gender one because um, I've been in the film industry my whole career and we have talked about, gender is just an example, it applies to all kinds of diversity, but we talk about needing to shift the needle, needing to change, but then quite often there are these reports that come out and it hasn't really moved very far and that's quite crushing and quite depressing for us all collectively when you, you, we see the stats and you're like, it hasn't changed. But I feel as though it's been changing. I feel as though the last three, four years, it, there had, something has happened. I don't, do, you, do you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. I think we, yeah, for sure on gender and certainly te definitely in terms of what the fund has backed. Um, I think there are obvious gaps and I, I'm not going to necessarily say what those are at the moment because I think they're probably quite obvious to quite a lot of people and that they're, yeah, just continuing to centre kind of diversity of experience, what's on the screen, behind the screen, also in terms of um, who makes the decisions, who's in the room, who's not in the room, like looking at all of that really is the most important thing, the commitment to that. You know, spent a lot of my career, you know, talking about, you know, gender quite a lot and talking about class quite a lot and, and then also, you know, lifting up my own privilege and like using that to say, right, who's not here with us? And who should be and so it's going to continue to, to do that and but also I'm really like passionate about audiences you know I, I actually really quite like populist cinema and you know I'd hope to see you know that we there's a kind of mix of work you know that yeah. we can look for people you know like again it's who how do we find the people who aren't coming to us you know it's as much about who's not coming to us yet where do we find them I mean, the kind of amazing thing about the BFI is like the scope of it, you know, Film Academy and Network and then F Film Fund and then all of the kind of audience space as well. It's kind of amazing to figure out how we connect everything up a bit more. And just, um, it's interesting you saying there, there are clearly gaps. Um, I'm going to try and phrase this so it's a question and not just a, a statement. One of the gaps that has been becoming clearer and clearer to me where we can work a bit harder, I think, is connecting. Cause I, I think actually the talent development work we're doing is really great, and mm -hmm. I think it's it's starting to produce some fantastic results. Um, but I feel like there is um, a space between talent development, production, and distribution and exhibition, and and it, it feels like we're not connecting those mm -hmm. worlds together effectively enough. Um, and I think that applies to all kinds of film. Um, short film, feature yep. film, documentary, but also now Mia and I are definitely on a, about to go on a voyage of discovery with how we work out how to build audiences for XR and VR. So I don't, is that something that you're, you're kind of clocking and thinking about, that, that gap between making something and actually thinking about how how you really Yeah, definitely. Audience? And actually I'm really keen to hear from people in the room as well because a lot of you you know, show the work and obviously there's kind of mixed fortunes, let's say, for that work. And, you know, uh, yeah, how, how do we how do we rectify that, you know, especially to 
for early work, you know, to make it actually the experience of showing positive and not maybe centering the things that, you know, we centre in the past, which is, you know, kind of, yeah, that releases look different and, the, you know, the significance of talent tours, especially early on in your career, it, you know, you probably do want to go around the country, but who pays for that, you know, and like things like that, I'm really interested in how, you know, all the stuff that I know about distribution exhibition, bringing that into the production development space as well and thinking about that earlier you know as you're sort of flagging really help, helping filmmakers think that about that earlier how are we going to show this who who is it for and literally thinking about how we show it where and to whom and, and how do we find them at different points in the film's journey um so yeah very keen on that and um the final point before we throw it open for me was um Picking up on what Mark was saying earlier, actually, where he, I've heard him say this before, and uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting thing to think about. He was saying, you know, the received wisdom about the film cycle is you have production, distribution, exhibition, and he was saying, actually, if you move exhibition to the front of that, and you, you take into account creatives, writers, filmmakers, directors, wh whoever, um, being inspired by the history of cinema, and, and, and having their own film culture, that suddenly opens up a really um, sort of transformational, transformational perspective on mm -hmm. how that cycle operates. And I think, you know, there's a big opportunity for us in connecting all of that great talent development work back into the history mm -hmm. of cinema. I mean, the BFI exists to promote the history of mm -hmm. cinema as an art form. So for me, that's something that I think is a really low-hanging fruit for us mm -hmm. to, to work on and, mm -hmm. and see what we can do there. Um, Sally, have you got questions for us? We do. Is this working? Yeah, we've got quite a few, actually. Um, some questions and some points. So we've covered a couple of questions, and then we'll come to some kind of thoughts. Um, one that's quite popular here is, how do we ensure the regions are listened to and more power is given to the local exec? Well, I mean, part, part of it is that, you know, I want to be out in a, across the country listening personally so you know as much as possible I'm, I'm not going to be sitting um, in London in an office just you know and be inaccessible I think we need to be accessible and out there and then again yeah as as is in baked into the question like you know empowering people decision making etc I um, don't know how we can do that at the moment but you know ideas um, welcome and yeah, we, we will figure that out for sure. It's a really important point. And, you know, I'm going to be based between Nottingham and London. So already that's, you know, a, a declaration of intent. You know, not um, half my time is not going to be spent in, in the metropolis. And I am adhering to that. Um, what are your thoughts about creating targeted initiatives for film and stories, not only for not only underrepresented communities, but also genre? The UK is heavily drama focused. Um, yeah, I mean, genre is, is really, you know, actually we have been covering genre, like The Feast is a really great horror film, it's really great, and it's in the Welsh language, who's ever seen that before? So actually I think, you know, I, I think it's sort of the, the quality of difference and then, and then looking at that in kind of the genre space and, and, and outside of just drama. So, yeah, for sure, I mean, we'll look at everything. I mean, in a way, we're kind of beholden to what comes to us, but, you know, that, again, is also, um, you know, something that we can can actually be looking at and in terms of how we actually invite invite filmmakers and and kind of centre ideas and maybe calls for genre film, more, more genre filmmaking. So definitely looking at that. Um. There's a comment here around short film packs. So someone's put, I would love to see short film packs made more available for cinema exhibition. They should be given the same treatment and respect as features. As example, <coughs> um, our audience really miss those BAFTA short films on the screen. Yeah, we're talking about that. And I mean, again, networks going through an evaluation and, you know, very, very keen again to, but we need people also to be responsive to showing and, and bringing shorts back more significantly I'm sure they are in certain places and not in others um, so yeah really keen to kind of help bridge that gap I mean some of it's about resource as well isn't it but I think the network um, are doing a really good job the hub's doing a really good job it's just yeah maybe beyond that we need some work 
Great, thank you. Uh, bringing Stuart in, um, to both of you, what's the most important aspect of cinema for you both, and what would you like to see exhibitors around the UK do more of in the future? Oh, wow. These are tough <laughs> ones. There's a lot, and they're all tough. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> what's the most... So, say the first bit again, sorry. Uh, what is the most important aspect of cinema for you both, and then what would you like to see the exhibitors around the UK do more of? Okay, um... So for me, the most important aspect of cinema, that's quite a, a weird way of phrasing it, but it's quite an interesting question. The most important aspect of cinema is that, um, oh God, I'm trying to say this without sounding like a complete wanker. Um, <laughs> it's, it's to do with it, the way it makes people feel, right? Mm. It's, you know, it's got to be that. You, you go to cinema and you, you go in feeling one way and you come out feeling completely different. So that transformational emotional thing um, the second bit I, the second bit's complicated uh, I mean I think without wanting to invoke the dreaded brexit um, I think in the context of brexit um, the thing that I'd like to see the exhibition sector do is is rally round get together and really support foreign language film I, I think that's required. <coughs> um, yeah, it's about community, isn't it? And that incredible communal experience. And yeah, that's not, something magical happens when you watch something on the big screen and you're entirely transported. And um, as we learn through Bird's Eye View um, and the way that we ran events and lots of other people do too, that actually inviting audiences' responses to films, you know, changing the way conversations happening in cinemas, um, is really important. We, you know, had lots of really profound experiences. Actually, <laughs> they were really profound. Um, and you know, in terms of people sharing really deep stuff, you know, in response to a film. And um, you know, I just think it's about opening these spaces up. However, we do it, and you know. I mean, in a way, what we can do is um, the BFI is, you know, bring the resource to that and maybe the connect, be the connective tissue um, to that. And, you know, again, like, you know, as I said before, we've, you know, I often see that, you know, filmmakers, you know, don't, there, there's often not enough resource to get filmmakers really out across the country and actors too. You know, they get booked on other jobs and, you know, we've got to look at that model. Actually, that's a big point. Like, just we need to look at the model and figure out how that how that gets supported more significantly because it's a really powerful thing. Um, I think that's a great point. Um, Mark and I were just chit-chatting earlier and comparing notes of the uh, experience of this most recent kind of uh, reopening and recovery for audiences. And we were both saying... Actually, the, the thing that's the catalyst is events. It's really events, and, you know, talent in front of audiences, um, that level of context that you get when somebody's in dialogue like this, that's been the thing that's transformed um, the recovery for, for Mark and, and for South Bank as well. Um, and it, we were both saying it, when we were in an environment where we were deliberately not doing events for safety reasons, um, the program just felt weird so, so, so that I think that's that's a great point mm. I think if we can un unlock some funds to support that that would be amazing for everybody mm -hmm. yeah. but you know there's tricky things like filmmakers don't get paid for that bit and you know that's quite tricky and actors don't pa get paid and so we've just got to look at, at the, these models I think um, isn't, isn't that about education and, and helping them to understand how important that is as part of the kind of um, part of the pro it's what we were talking about earlier an integral part of the process of reaching that audience yeah yeah I yeah. Think that's, that's yeah that's what it is yeah. um yeah I think that's my answer thank you very much um, we've got a comment that sort of leads to somebody else's question so this is the comment um someone would like to see film fund categories and funds less constricted by genre and platform and much more work crosses XR documentary and narrative so more flexibility and format but then a linked question to that is how do we tackle digital poverty and separately class as a barrier to creation, both in terms of VR and XR, but also filmmaking more generally? 
Um, oh yeah, that's a complicated one. I mean, you know, you know, part of it is our job to make sure that you know when we're inviting applications, where we go even to like find what we need to be out there finding people who are not represented in our industry and um, and 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 also perhaps centering different priorities and different even ways of conversing what we invite applications to look like you know all of that needs to be looked at you know even um i was listening to Gemma desai's um best girl grip podcast the other day and she was talking about something i've been reading about a lot like our language um it not just bfi everyone's language in film and like just literally simple things like submit your film submission not a great word, is it? Um, so, you know, all of that, all of the barriers at language occasions and without us even thinking about it because it's just all the, the words that we've just always used, you know, um, and what that kind of does to people who really aren't represented and, and don't know anyone, like, you know, I mean, I, I relate to that. You know, I, I didn't know anyone in film and I, you know, I got really lucky when I was, a, when I was 19 and got a job completely by it was a fluke and but you know I didn't go to university I didn't go to film school I didn't I didn't you know think film was a career it, it, I just got lucky so I would love to make lots of people who are like me not not just to be the lucky one um but and do more work around that for sure and so that's something yeah very very big on um, there's one here, Mia, specifically for you around. Um, the press piece that announced your appointment mentioned it would be for a fixed term. Can you expand why that's important to you? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. It's like it's a model that sort of happens in Scandinavia and in, in, uh, in other um, across Europe. I notice a lot more um, that that the because it's sort of recognised that the you know you have quite a lot of influence and that that actually you know you kind of have a, you have a, it's like politics you have a term you're kind of voted in and then you're off <laughs> and um there's something really quite galvanizing about that actually and i'm very comfortable with that because i'm a producer and i run my own businesses i run a charity you know i don't I don't, I've never had a job for longer than like four years. I'm sort of, I thought I was unemployable actually. So it's, I've, I've mainly been creating jobs for myself for quite a long time. So it was quite, it was miraculous to me to actually be hired. Um, and so, yeah, there's something kind of galvanizing about that, about t knowing how long you got, get in there, get out. And um, it's it's kind of useful and it's so make your mark. I mean, I sort of feel like, I keep describing this, it's slightly unpleasant description, that I feel like a host body, <laughs> uh, which is that um, I don't, I'm not here to represent, I'm not here to further my own career and, and be powerful for power's sake or any of that. I'm not interested in any of that, which is why I was quite, um, I thought very, very hard before applying for this job and um, because of that. And so, I, yeah, I feel like I, I you know, Pete, I want, I want to represent in, in all the ways that I possibly can and all those things like, um, yeah, visions and missions and taste. Not, not really my bag. Um, and you know, it's like, what's best for what? What do we need next? What do we need now? And who, who does, who is we even? Um, and uh, yeah, that's the most important thing for me, really. Speaking for, so that's why I really want to listen because I want to hear like, what do you want next? What do you think we should be doing? Where are the gaps? You know, what kind of films are missing? You know, and and why do we need them next? if we can be that specific and prescriptive. Um, got two questions that are fairly similar, so sorry to the audience, I'm gonna kind of merge them together for Mia. Um, you're obviously six weeks in, but this question asks, does working at the BFI feel as though you've been tasked to do something in terms of maybe diversity of who gets funding? Uh, do you believe the BFI is truly changing? Do I feel tasked to do something? Yeah, do you feel tasked to do something? i.e. diversity who gets funding, and then have you had your hands tied behind your back or do you feel that the BFI is truly changing? Yeah, I mean, there's enormous amount of change happening. Um, lots of new colleagues coming in. Is Jason Wood here? I think he's watching online. online. 
Hello, Jason online. He's got a broken leg. Hope it's feeling all right, Jason. He's my uh, new boss, so I would say that, wouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, a lot of that, um, Jason's one of many examples. And so, yeah, really excited about all the um, new people coming in and mixing with the people who've got a lot of organisational knowledge and awareness. I mean, that helps you need a blend because actually, um, yeah, history is quite important to what we do. I can say something about that. I've been at the BFI for quite a long time. Um, I mean, it's an institution, um, and institutions are slow by definition. And one of the institution's great strengths is not just the BFI, but all institutions, is that you have people who stay a long time and do really deep research work and, and other kinds of, and, and there's a depth of experience in the organisation. Um, but the, the change has definitely been happening in the last few years. And it feels like it's accelerating in a way, albeit within an institutional framework. So it's, it, from an individual perspective, it sometimes feels like it's not happening quick enough. But when you step back and look at two years ago, three years ago, you're like, oh, holy shit. Mm. It has changed. So, so the, I think genuinely the answer is it's changing. But mm -hmm. I, I, I understand that it, it appears slow or it feels like perhaps it's not changing. But... Trust me, there's a lot of change happening. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and Ben Roberts, you know, it's like how how many? Well, he started in March, he... and then it was COVID. So right. Yeah. He hasn't really started, I don't no. think. No. I mean, he's starting to. You can see that he's rewiring, and there's a restructure, and there's new people coming in. But probably what isn't as um, evident from outside is the new culture that Ben's kind of um, yep. trying to bring about within the organisation. And again, a culture change isn't something that just happens. It's, it's going to take probably two or three years for the way that people think, the way people behave, um, the way that people expect their colleagues to behave towards them as well. That, that kind of stuff is, I think, a gradual process. Um, but there's lots of great people helping us. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, I, I feel really positive and optimistic. Yeah, I do too. Rico's out there somewhere. <laughs> He's helping us. <laughs> okay, they're coming in thick and fast, so I'm trying to keep up here. Um, does contemporary British film have an identity for audiences, and does it need one? Does contemporary British film have an identity for audiences? That's a really good question. That's interesting. Um, contemporary British film. <sighs> oh, it's kind of impossible to answer, because you never, when you're in it, you, you can never quite see it. Um, I always find it super interesting to be able to look back and say, you know, what is the cinema of the new Labour era? And you can, when you've got hindsight, you can see it. It's like really obvious. And I, I feel like when you're living it and you in these films that that Mia's presenting on the screen, we don't quite know how they sit together yet. We don't quite know how they land with audiences, but. Um, I think contemporary British cinema is an, in an exciting place. Um, I think since God's Own Country, we've had uh, incredible films mm. in this country. Um, do they have an identity for audiences? Uh, that's a really hard question to answer. Um, I don't really see it as an identity that finds meaning in the audience, but I do see certain trends and certain things happening which are exciting. Like So at the moment, there's something really exciting with um, in British cinema with women and horror, which is, I mean, Saint, you know, the best film, Censor, um, St. Maud, and there's more on the way. Mm -hmm. So that's that's something you can look at and say, something's happening, why is it happening, what's, what's, what's led to that mm -hmm. particularly. Um, for me, I think understanding how those trends kind of come about and Utilising your learnings is, is a good thing to look at, I think. Um, but does it have an identity? I, I don't know. That's hard to answer, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think actually in our consultation process, we quite significantly asked audiences so it'll be really about that. So mm. it would be really interesting to get the answer to that. I mean, I guess, I guess what you'd hope is that people are going to the cinema and seeing films that reflect something of the experience of being British and, and living in 
the UK at, the, at this present time. And I think, you know, if you look at I, Daniel Blake and Lynn and Lucy and Steve McQueen's Small Axe, probably I think Steve's films are probably the most important films that have been made in the last decade. That and uh, unbelievable how he, the whole way that he approached it and managed to make them all at, at the same time and kind of launch them one after the other. That feels like a moment in British cinema that we will all look at and talk about for a really long time. Um, I think Lovers Rock was voted the number one film in the, in the Sight and Sound poll last year, which in itself is really interesting because, strictly speaking, it's television. Mm. I mean, it's not, is it? It's cinema, but it's made for telly. Um, so, yeah, I, I think when audiences are seeing films, those films and many others, Limbo, Censor, um, Bait, uh, I'm really trying not to just list films that we've released <laughs> after love. Um, I, I think all of those films are showing you aspects of contemporary British identity, um, and that's something that cinema does that other art forms I, I don't think can do with the same level of, level of uh, immediacy. Um, yeah. Um, okay, how do we diversify who programs our regional film festivals when there's frequently no funding to pay programmers? So, sorry, say that again. How, how, how do we diversify who programs our regional film <coughs> festivals when there's frequently no funding to pay programmers? How do we diversify who programs regional film festivals? I, I don't know. <laughs> 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 um, I don't know if I should answer that. I just, I, uh, how do we diversify who programs um, how can I answer? so I can only really say stuff about my own direct kind of role and remit and my experience um, and I don't run any regional film festivals I, I think the way that we at the South Bank are engaging with other voices and freelance programmers and other freelancers is something we're looking at at the moment. I know there's a session on it, is it later or tomorrow? Which I'm going to go to, which, which sounds really interesting. Um, you know, the London Film Festival itself has a kind of um, programme advisor structure where there's lots of voices that are not, um, they're not people employed by the BFI, but they, they come in and build the festival programme. I don't know if that's a model which regional film festivals can look at and replicate. Um, I think Sheffield already, well, Sheffield's had its problems, obviously, but I, I think they had a, a similar structure where there were, there were other voices in their programming mix. Um, in terms of how we do it, that's probably a question that Ben Luxford could answer a lot better than I'm doing right now. <laughs> we will take that to him yeah. and share. Make a fund or something. Um, so we've got five minutes. Yeah, five minutes left. Uh, we can squeeze in another couple. Um, is the measure of success for the feature films always commercial, or are there other measures that you can speak about? For the film fund, no. It's actually. I mean, commercial. Commercial is a really tricky word. It's too. It's really loaded. <laughs> what does it even really mean? You have to unpack it. Um, a lot is it commercial? Commercial in terms of a domestic situation? Is it commercial? Lots of films do really well by selling internationally everywhere. You know, there, there's lots of different yeah. ways films are and aren't commercial. Sometimes it's not in the theatrical space, but it's in other the other routes to market. Uh, so there's lot that's definitely um, not one of the pillars, as you saw in the the priorities. It's not it's not about commerciality. It's but it's about sustainability. So it is about helping filmmakers, particularly producers, create sustainable businesses by figuring out where kind of how how to help them um, center commerciality for their business potentially but that that can be by making really kind of risky art house films actually for some there's a massive payoff um so yeah i think it's much more that's that's box office is is not one of the kind of pillars of success of, of the fund at all um, I, I think more generally as well um you know the, the cinema Cinema exhibition is a highly evolved model, right? It's been going a hundred years, and the fact it's interesting to me the f that cinema, as an evolved model, has decided to share all of its data, and 
other forms of commerciality in film are not sharing data, I, I do think at some point that will change and everyone will share all their data for everything because definitely within the cinema exhibition sector or distribution sector, everyone sharing the data helps everybody. There's like a kind of, you know, you might be in competition, but you're also brothers in arms in a way. Um, and that marketplace uh, sensibility is something that I, is not happening in the streamers at the moment. Um, but it's always fascinating to me that people look at the numbers that are published, which is how many tickets are sold in cinemas, and think that's how well that's filmed has done. Whereas, as Mia says, it might have sold in regions all over the world and made back its production budget before it's even sold a single ticket in a cinema. Um, we're finding some like really amazing results in BFI Player at the moment. A film like County Lines, which is a tiny little film in terms of budget production, but very, very powerful in terms of emotional impact. Um, that had its kind of theatrical journey completely destroyed by COVID, but it's the most watched film in BFI Player. Mm. So it's a commercial success for us. Mm. It's the producers probably actually haven't seen as much commercial success as they would have done if it had had a really remarkable cinema outcome. And that's something I think for the industry to start looking at, like how can we, because the data's not there because people aren't seeing how many views they're getting in the streaming platform. You know, they get fees and things, but I think there's a kind of, there's a real, uh, there's a bit of mystery around the reality of films and their commercial successes. I mean, you can dig into it if you like, but um, I do hope that in the digital realm, people start sharing data a lot more openly so mm -hmm. that we've got a more real picture of what's happening, especially with independent cinema. I think it's mm -hmm. important um, mm -hmm. with the studios and the big, bigger, you know, you know, the big budget stuff, that's probably less our mm -hmm. bag to worry about. Mm -hmm. We've got two minutes. Um, just a comment to answer one of your questions, um, Mia, that you've put up there. So what would you like to see the Film Fund do? Um, so someone's put, replicate the joined up approach of the film hubs and network in England across all of the nations. Mm -hmm. um, and a question linking to that one around um, something that Michael brought up. Is there scope for more region-led debut feature commissions led by region-based BFI network talent execs? We'll see. We'll have a look at that. <laughs> so thank you yeah, for that, that point. It's, a, it's one to go in there. In under my thinking cap. And I think that's everything we have time for. Sorry to people that posted questions. There's a few in here we didn't get round to, but um, we can share those with Stuart and Mia. I just have one more thing, which was, um, Sally reminded me, last time I was here, I got everyone to repeat something. And I thought, oh, that's a really good idea. I'm going to get to, I'm going to do that again. So, um, oh, where's it gone? <coughs> can we get my presentation back up? Whilst we're doing that, I'll just say, um, I'm here all day today and all day tomorrow, so if you have a question that isn't for the wider group, just come and say hello and ask me whatever you like. Um, it's nice to be here with everybody. Um, uh, forgive me for, I, did, I didn't mean to be pretentious by pulling out a Robert Bresson quote, <laughs> but um, I'm just running with it, so can you run with me or walk with me or whatever, sit with me too. Um, it's just such a wonderful quote, I just love it so much, and so I just thought if we could all put in the room our voice, um, and yeah, so just um, show what without you may never be seen, so repeat after me, show... What without you may never be seen. Amen, women and non-binaries to that. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, Stuart.